right, greetings to my ever-loyal Hurley-Burleyites, and welcome to the only political podcast in Canada whose host did work for Wild Bill Hunter back in 1983 to almost, almost pry the St. Louis Blues out of St. Louis and relocate them to Saskatoon. We had 18,000 season tickets committed to a proposed 18,000 seat arena. Yep, the Saskatoon Blues were a thing for about 15 minutes or so until the NHL's Board of Governors, through to their assholery, blocked the transaction. In fact, it was Ed Snyder of the Philadelphia Flyers. So if you want to hate Philadelphia Flyers, here's an additional reason. I still have my Saskatchewan's Got the Blues commemorative puck. And why do I tell you this, Hurley Burleyites? Because I love my home province, and today on the Hurley Burley, we have another proud son of Saskatchewan and current resident of Saskatoon, Tim Gitzel. Tim has been the CEO of Cameco, the world's largest publicly traded uranium company, for over a decade now. In 2015, Cameco accounted for 18% of the planet's production of uranium. A lawyer by training, <laughs> a lawyer by training, he currently sits on the boards of the World Nuclear Association, Washington's Nuclear Energy Institute, and the Business Council of Canada. Tim was named one of 100 alumni of influence from the University of Saskatchewan, and he's a recipient of the Saskatchewan Centennial Medal. Yep, all the Sasky honors that seem to have eluded your favorite podcast host. <laughs> But back to Tim and nuclear energy. We're going to talk about the history of nuclear in Canada and the role it can play in the fight against climate change. What are the newest technologies? What are the risks and downsides? And how are these risks and the issues around waste being addressed? Tim, welcome to the Hurley Burley. So glad you're here. It's great to see you again. It's been hey, since David. about 1990 since we were in a classroom together. Yeah, David, it is absolutely a pleasure for me to be on your show and to see you uh, again. I think we first met uh, probably 87 on the steps of the U of S law school. I don't remember you attending any classes after that until you came to pick up your diploma. <laughs> so how you ended up uh, with the law degree is a bit of a mystery out here, but uh, you're the more famous one for sure. It was a bargain. I promised I wouldn't practice. They gave me the degree. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the same for me, David. So anyway, it's great to see you. I did see you. Uh, two, about two years ago, it was just before we all got locked down, you did a hurly-burly uh, show live in Ottawa. At the and, Canadian uh, Nuclear Association. You got it. And happened to be there and sat in and got to see you and meet the, the cast members, and it was quite a thrill. So it was great. Yeah, I know. Everybody likes to meet Jenny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so how are you? Let's start with that. Like... Uh, Saskatchewan has been an interesting place during COVID. Um, you've not been as locked down as some other parts of the country have, but how have you been? Yeah, David, you know, I'm good. I'm great. Uh, compared to many, many others uh, around the piece, uh, my lot is good. And, you know, you can start out the conversation by, seeing you're, by saying you're grumpy and upset and frustrated and all that, and that just gets you absolutely nowhere. <laughs> And so, you know, try and keep a positive attitude and uh, around the office here and at home. And, and you know what? We're good. Thanks. We're, we're going to get through it and we'll be fine. Um, so let's do a little background, Tim. Let's, how did you get to your current position? We went to law school together and I've been scratching out a living ever since. Just happy I'm not doing real estate law. How did you get to be the CEO of Cameco? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a story for sure, David. Uh, you know, I grew up in uh, small town Saskatchewan. My dad was an RCMP and my mom was a nurse. And uh, those days in the, in the late 60s, 70s, uh, we moved around every three years. That's how you did with the RCMP. And he got uh, hopefully a promotion and played hockey all the time. We played road hockey out in the streets of Meadow Lake and Loon Lake and Morris and Herbert and Prince Albert and North Battleford. We, I think I lived in seven or eight communities and and grew up uh, in Saskatchewan. And, and you know what my break was when I was 17, 1979, I was 17. I applied for a job at one of the uranium mines as a summer student working in the warehouse and got hired on. And uh, up at Clough Lake, they were just building the mine. That was one of the early peaks for nuclear power when, you know, it was too cheap to meter and boy, they were looking for uranium everywhere. And so I got on and I kept applying summer after summer uh, for the uh, for the job up north. And in one year, uh, 
The president of the company said, uh, well, how about uh, we send you to Paris to work in our head office? It was a French-owned company. Uh, instead of, uh, I was going to university. I'd started university by then. And rather than working up at the mine site, and I had to think about that for all of about eight seconds, and, and off I went. And so that was a start. And then I came back, went to University of Laval for a, a year to take French immersion and, and then ended up in law school and with you. David came out, practiced law for a, a very short time. They uh, weren't thrilled with my uh, practicing skills, uh, maybe like you. Ended up with the government uh, for a little while. The government had just changed over. The Romano government came in and did a stint down there. Jonathan Wilkinson was a big wheel there at the time. And then uh, right to the mining company back in, in about 90, 90, end of 92, early 93. And so I worked 15 years for the French company. Uh, they're called Orano now. It was Arriva. 10 years in Canada, I became the president of Arriva Canada, and then I got transferred to France, worked in Paris, looked after the worldwide mining business unit. Uh, we were in Africa and Mongolia and Kazakhstan and Australia, and I, me, me and Air France were tight, uh, we could say. And, and then 15 years ago, I got a chance, I got a call from here, from Cameco, Canadian company, uh, you know, it's a company I, I'd grown up uh, peeking through the window and saying, geez, one day I hope I could uh, work there. And Got a call to come back. So we came back from France and uh, been the CEO for uh, 11 years. They haven't figured me out uh, quite yet. And I'm, I'm still here and, and we're going strong, David. So that's that's kind of the story. You joke, but that is actually a long tenure for a CEO in today's corporate world. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think the average tenure is probably three or four years. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been a run. But I can tell you, it hasn't been a picnic over the last last uh, 10 or 11 years, uh, I took over and I'm a bit like Schleprock. And when I say Schleprock to the young kids, they look at me like, what are you talking about? But, you know, you got that cloud hanging over you. I took over just after, just after the Fukushima accident, like a month after uh, they threw me the right. keys and said, it's right. all yours. And uh, so we've had a tough, it's been a tough highway for us for 10 years. Uh, the market went down uh, nuclear uh, power got uh, you know getting some some bad reviews. Uh, demand for our product was down, and so it's taken us now ten about ten years to to recover. Uh, happy to say, uh, last year was a real transition year for nuclear power, and then of course for us as a as a fuel supplier. And now we've got a real tailwind. Now uh, you're talking to me. Uh, lots of people talking nuclear. Uh, we're we're back on on stage again, and uh, the future looks pretty good for us. Okay, so quickly, Cameco, just give us an outline of what Cameco is. It's, it's uh, the leading Canadian uranium mining company, and uh, it has operations only in Canada or around the world? So we're around the world, David, uh, not to go too far back, but 88, you had governments uh, Mulroney Divine uh, running province and country. They both owned assets, mining assets, El Dorado, and then the uranium mining assets, and said governments shouldn't be in the mining business and the nuclear business. So they came, put them together, created a company called Cameco, and uh, eventually uh, listed it on the Toronto and New York stock exchanges, sold them, sold off the shares. And, and so that was the genesis of the company 30-some uh, years ago now. We have the world's best uranium mining assets in, in northern Saskatchewan here, Cigar Lake Mine, you might have heard of it, MacArthur River. Uh, we've got uh, fuel fabrication facilities in Ontario, in, in Blind River, if you're driving along the Trans Canada, you'll go right, right by it. Port Hope and Coburg, we have manufacturing facilities, we make fuel bundles for uh, Bruce Power, OPG. And then we're in uh, we're in other countries. We're, we have Wyoming mine. We have a mine in Nebraska. We're in Kazakhstan. <laughs> it's been interesting. Uh, we have properties, two nice properties in Australia. So, and then offices in the U.S. Uh, we're into uh, an enrichment play in in, uh, in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina. So, yeah, we're worldwide, David. Okay, is there any purpose for uranium besides supplying fuel to nuclear reactors? Is there any use for uranium other than that? Yes, I'd, I'd say there is. There's medical isotopes. And people uh, want to get into the discussion right away about generating nuclear power. And it's a bit controversial. And where's the waste going all that? And I'm sure we'll talk about all that. But people forget about the isotopes that come from uranium when you use it in a What's reactor. an isotope? Yeah, What's so, an isotope? Yeah, so it's a, 
you know, uranium uh, is uh, made of U-235 and 238 isotopes. It's a, a particle of an atom that, uh, that the fissile piece that we look for is the U-235 isotope. It's a piece of an atom uh, that, that uh, fissions. That, uh, that fissions when you, uh, when you bombarded with neutrons, and I'm not the actual, remember I went to law school with you, but you bombarded, creates great heat uh, when, you, when you split them, and, and then you boil water, create steam, turn a generator, and create electricity. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. So. But after you uh, use up some of the uranium, they, they, they transmute into different isotopes. So cobalt-60, David, you'll know that one. Cobalt-60 used to treat cancer. Uh, you'll remember from, I think it's 1951, Harold Johns at the University of Saskatchewan, Sylvia Fedoric, University of Saskatchewan, harvested cobalt-60, had the first cancer treatments. And, and we still do that. Bruce Power, we harvest uh, isotopes, Bruce Power does. And they're used around the world to treat cancer, to sterilize uh, different equipment. And so that's a, that's a different use of uranium. But other than that, it's really to generate uh, nuclear electricity. Last week, Hurley Burleyites, I promised you a riveting story about megahertz, which is the way electromagnetic spectrum is measured. And I know what you're thinking. It's beyond my meager talents to make a thing like megahertz compelling. Well, I take that as a challenge, so listen closely. It's part of a larger story from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, on how we get high-speed 5G wireless connectivity right across the whole of Canada not just big cities, but all rural, remote, and Indigenous communities. Not just now, but for a generation. This is Chapter 2, the 100 megahertz, mega-critical, mega-decision. 100 megahertz is no arbitrary measure. It's the international standard for 5G mobile and wireless broadband, set by no lesser a body than the UN's International Telecommunications Union. Countries all over the world use that standard as they compete fiercely in the innovation economy. Countries that Canada can't afford to fall behind. 100 megahertz of mid-band spectrum would also allow carriers like TELUS to deliver the maximum benefits of 5G to their customers. It's so much faster, with the ability to carry tons of data over really long distances. But here's where it gets even more important. With caps at 100 megahertz, Four different carriers will have enough of that spectrum to launch their 5G networks equally in every market, which means they'll have to compete aggressively. So let's recap. 100 megahertz caps means fierce competition, fair prices. Canada keeps up with the rest of the world. I think that's pretty compelling stuff. As I speak these words, the feds are having public consultations on the best way to auction this 5G spectrum to carriers. They want optimal service for all Canadians. TELUS wants that too. 100 megahertz caps just happens to be the key to getting there. We'll talk more about it next week. But in the meantime, you can have your say right now by going to telus.com slash get 5G right. Okay, so it's no secret to listeners of either the Curse of Politics or the Hurley Burley that I am a supporter of nuclear energy. And so I'm going to switch roles in this show, and I'm going to put you uh, through your paces about nuclear um, and see where, see where we end up. So let's start with this proposition. Central to fighting climate change is electrification. We have to move everything possible onto electri electricity, away from any other fuel source. We need as much stuff running off electricity as possible. Plus... We need to get all the fossil fuels like coal and gas out of electrification so that we've got a 100% clean grid. Plus, we need a lot more electricity than we are currently generating if we're going to be running everything off of electricity. Take cars, for example. So that's the challenge, right? Create a much larger grid that is 100% clean. Can this be done with renewable energy alone? No, no, you, you, you nailed it. You nailed the thesis. Uh, you know, you, you got to believe first that uh, climate change, climate catastrophe, global warming exists and it's real and it's an existential threat. If you don't believe that, then we can turn the page and talk about something else. People believe that. I believe that because the scientists say that 
many thousands of them say that, just like COVID. I believe them when they say we should get vaccinated. I believe them. And so we do. So then you say, well, how are we going to do that? Well, then you have a toolbox of, of options. We, we know we want to uh, reduce CO2 over time. We know we can't get rid of it overnight. It's just a pipe dream. We have to transition to, to cleaner fuel. So what are your options? Well, coal. Okay. People say, ooh, coal. I don't like coal very much. Maybe carbon capture, utilization storage, maybe. Okay, a bit of that. But, uh, you know, in Saskatchewan, we said we're phasing out coal by 2030. That's like tomorrow. So what are we going to do there? Okay, so you don't like coal very much. Oil. Well, nobody really uses oil to produce electricity. And to be honest, it's got just about as much uh, emissions as, as coal. So that's probably not on the list. And it's getting close to 100 bucks a barrel now, too. Gas, well, it emits half of the uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour that, uh, that coal and, and oil do. And it's got to be a transition fuel for us. Look, I, we are not anti-fossil fuels at all. We say we've got a toolbox, open it up, let's see what's inside. So those are three things that are in. We want to phase out over time, and we will. Well, then hydro. Everybody loves hydro. Yep, absolutely, hydro is good. But you got to have a, a river to dam up, and, and there are consequences to doing that. And I dare say, uh, citing a nuclear plant and citing a new hydroelectric power station uh, would have the same environmental issues to deal with. Uh, neither one of them's easy. And, 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 you know, they say, well, nuclear... You could only have done James Bay in the 60s and 70s. You could only have done James Bay in the 60s and 70s. You'd never get away with James Bay now. Site, site C, that's the, how's that working out? Uh, Muskrat yeah. Falls, how's that working out? I mean, and I'm not dissing them. We need them. That's clean energy, mm -hmm. but they're expensive and they're big projects and there's going to be overruns. But once you get them built, they're going to be there for 80 years, 100 years and provide clean electricity. As long as you can deal with the, the, uh, the land you've had to take up uh, to do that. And then there's nuclear. And people say, ooh, nuclear, ooh, don't really love that. Some people say that, don't really love that. Why? Well, look at the cost overruns. I say, yep, there have been cost overruns. You're right. You know, when we're building new plants, uh, first of a kinds, new technologies, there's going to be cost overruns. But I can also show you, United Arab Emirates just built four on time, on budget. The French can do it. The Chinese are doing it. The Russians can do it on time, on budget. We can do it. We just, you can't build one every 20 years and then say, well, geez, we went over budget and, and, and over cost. So, you know, there, there's no, and of course, wind and solar, David. I mean, everybody loves wind and solar, including me, but we're just not there yet. Uh, first, you, you know, their, their, their efficiency ranges from maybe 20 to 40% efficient. I can tell you at Christmas time here, or through the new year, it was minus 35 for three weeks in a row. I watched as the, uh, whatever I was it is, there. Was I was there. Yeah, you were there. So the, the, the steam comes up or the smoke comes up out of the building next door. Straight, there wasn't a breath of wind, not a breath of wind. For two weeks, and there was no sun. And if it came out, it only comes between 10 a.m. and about four. And so, you know, yeah, I like wind and solar, but you got to back them up. So then you say, well, what are we going to back up with? I say nuclear. I mean, that's a perfect combination. Wind and solar as much as you can, and, and then back it up with uh, baseload nuclear. And so, you know, there the, you got a toolbox. You got to look at everything in the toolbox. I just don't think we can afford to throw any of the tools out while we're trying to fix the problem of climate change. Okay, well, I know that people who don't agree with us will say that renewable energy, solar and wind, have become more efficient and less expensive every year. That there's been tremendous progress made on that technology. And that if we just focused our investment on developing that rather than in nuclear, it could get to where we need it to go. Not a lot of money being spent on investment in nuclear, at least, but not by public authorities. So I, I, I don't disagree with that, uh, that premise that we should be spending a lot. And yes, the costs are coming down, but it's still, I think I heard uh, Jenny on one of your other shows say wind and solar represent 7% of the Canadian or world production of electricity. I mean, we, you said it, we need everything we've got made clean. And then we need to double or triple it. The population of the world's going from 7 billion to 10 billion, billion people without right. electricity. I mean, we have a massive, massive issue here. And so all the tools and yeah, let's do wind and solar. And, and I'm, I'm in all the way for future generations. I hope we can find wind and solar and battery storage that solves all the problems. 
we're not there today. So we got to find something else. I want to get into some specifics about nuclear. Before I do that, though, maybe you could explain to our listeners what the concept of baseload electricity is in, an, in a grid. Yeah. So, David, the uh, baseload would be your, your coal-fired plant, uh, gas-fired plant, nuclear plant, where you've got fuel on site. You fire them up, and they run 90-plus percent of the time. Now, you have to take them down once in a while, maybe to reload fuel, or to change out some turbines or parts, but they really, it's baseload. You can count on it to run 24 seven. Baseload is 24 seven. So when you have intermittent electricity, there's your wind. I mean, you get electricity when the wind's blowing, you get uh, solar when the sun's shining and your panels aren't covered over with snow or something else. So when that's not, you can't just say, well, we'll shut the hospitals down until the sun comes back out. And you know, you, you gotta have backup power for it. So. That's why we've relied for so long on, on coal and, and, and gas and nuclear. And we're going to have to going forward uh, until we can get the wind and solar to be more than, and I don't know the exact numbers, I see 20 to 40% efficient. That's the amount of time they run. So you've actually got to duplicate the power uh, situation with something to back it up. And tricky part is sometimes flexing your nuclear plant. You say, well, we'll let the wind and solar run while it can, but when it's down, then we'll fire up the nuclear plant. Not always that easy, but it can be done. So pretty soon, it'll be two years since we were all pulled into this whirlpool of a pandemic. Two years. Remember the early scares, the toilet paper shortages, the sanitizer shortages, the job losses, the stock market crash and rebound back in early 2020? People had no idea where it was all heading. And you know, some fears were justified. Turns out those overseas supply chains we rely on so heavily are pretty fragile. But within North America, the fuel and the minerals and the manufactured goods and grain and the livestock and groceries and all the other things upon which our way of life depends have kept moving. Even the cargo from abroad that does manage to make it to our seaports reaches stores and consumers in timely fashion. And no company is more vital to keeping our domestic supply chains flowing smoothly than our sponsor, CN. If you've got it, a train probably brought it. From day one of the pandemic, CN employees have been reporting for work and keeping our economy moving. During those long months when the U.S.-Canada border was closed to most of us, CN trains kept rolling and rolling on time, heading down through the American heartland to the Gulf of Mexico and back. They still are. Our weather is changing too, to put it mildly. Last winter was harsh, and we've already gone through a few tough months this winter. But you know, CN knows how to deal with deep cold and ice. The C in CN does stand for Canadian. Last summer brought disastrous heat and wildfires. Scientists are predicting more in the year to come. Ultimately though, CN's trains will run on time. They simply have to. We all have plenty to worry about nowadays. Life is getting more expensive. Everything is getting more complicated. We still don't know where the pandemic is going. But when we do get to the other side, it will be because CN's trains helped get us there. That you can count on. What do you know about geothermal? Some people tell me geothermal is the answer to baseload energy. Yeah, I like it. I, I don't know enough about it, David. Uh, I know some people uh, use it, obviously, uh, and if that's a solution, certainly for heating, uh, central heating in, in houses and communities. In fact, a good friend of mine has geothermal heating in his house. He lives just out of town. Uh, uh, loves it. Whether you can do it on a, on a mass industrial scale and uh, generate the, uh, you know, the megawatts of electricity we need, I don't know that. But I don't know why someone hasn't done it if it's possible or, or if there's a cost barrier. Uh, right. I, I love the I love the idea. I mean, it's perfect. You got boiling water a mile underground. You pipe it up and it's, it's steam and and it turns your turbine beautiful. If it works, that's another tool in the toolbox, and we should be spending money on that, David. Okay, so nuclear. Let's start with money and cost you kind of blew through this and said well you know we don't build enough of them so we get cost overruns but we have some horrible stories financially in this country about nuclear plants um in terms of like i think darlington was a massive 
massively more expensive than it was anticipated to be uh, when it was built. And, and that's pretty much the last thing built in Canada um, was uh, OPG's Darlington plant. Um, and, you know, you're right. All big construction projects seem to be plagued with delays and cost overruns. And nuclear is at a minimum no exception to that. So when you factor all that in, is nuclear too expensive? Well, I would say no. I, I, I don't deny the cost overruns, and I can give you some, some horrific examples, if you like. Uh, over in Finland, a uh, plant, uh, Okolowoto, that uh, the French have been building, and it's just starting up this year, probably six or seven years uh, late, and, and, and costs overrun. But new tech, first of a kind, the folk, they call them, first of a kind technology, uh, building an, an EPR-1600. So they said the next one will be cheaper and the next one cheaper. That doesn't excuse the first one. Uh, Vogel down in the United States, Westinghouse uh, building AP 1000s, same thing. Uh, now there's COVID excuses and there's lots of other excuses, but no, that they, they, they are expensive. No question. The upfront capital, David, is huge. We're talking billions and we've struggled on some of the new ones, especially getting them on time on budget. But when they do start, that's the good news is that those things are going to run for 40, 60. And now I was just on an NEI call yesterday. They're getting life extensions to 80 years for those plants. So you start amortizing whatever capital you had in, in 2022 over 80 years, and you'll see your, your unit cost gets down uh, to a pretty reasonable level. And I think as the IEA came out, uh, and I can show you studies and people believe them or don't believe them, but, but that nuclear over time, is one of the lowest cost uh, clean energy options that exists. So, you know, I, I don't uh, say we're, I, I don't deny and I don't say we're perfect, uh, but, uh, you know, compared to the others, uh, you could you could probably do the same comparison with the others and say uh, nobody's perfect in this game. But we are getting better. The Chinese, let me just give you the Chinese example, David. And, of course, Chinese 20 years ago, no reactors, none. And they decided we can't keep burning coal and building a new coal plant every week. So we've got to move to nuclear and, and they have. So now 20 years later, they have 50, five zero nuclear plants. We have 19. They have another 20 under construction that'll be done by 2025. And they hope to have 120 by 2030. I mean, it's just massive growth, but they're cookie cuttering them now. They're building their design. They know how to build them. And they, when you build them in series like that, they get the costs down and the timelines down. So can be done. It was done in the 70s when we all were building Sweden and Finland and Japan and France and Canada and the U.S. But we haven't done it for a while. So uh, we'll have to get back and, and get good at it again. So what happened to that nuclear surge in the 70s? I guess Three Mile Island happened to that nuclear surge. Chernobyl happened to that nuclear surge. Um, and um, a lot of pop culture references we've talked in this show about the China syndrome and various things, but we all, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw it. I watched that Chernobyl series on HBO, and it was uh, pretty horrific shit um, that was going down there. So, and then, and then nuclear maybe seemed on the verge of a renaissance, and then Fukushima came along in Japan. And so... What do you say to people who say, this is a dangerous technology? I mean, we, we shouldn't be messing around with this because it's got catastrophic potential ramifications. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd say, unfortunately, uh, the perception of nuclear doesn't match the reality, David. Uh, if you look at Three Mile Island and what happened, and it came out to exactly the same time as the, <laughs> the China syndrome uh, uh, I think Scott referred to it. somebody had all the actors even lined up for that one. Uh, yeah. So it came out at a, at a time they're scared people. And, and all of a sudden this too cheap to meter nuclear power was, Ooh, maybe we should take another look and it's a bit dangerous. And that didn't, that didn't really kill that slowed the momentum for sure. For sure. In the United States, it did. Chernobyl was bad. Let's not kid ourselves. You saw it. I saw it. Uh, that was uh, 86. Uh, of course, they didn't tell anybody. Old Russian technology, uh, just a bunch of bungling that went on there. And there were there was damage, human and otherwise damage, and no question about it. So that was 86. Then we were in the tank for a while after that. Of course, everybody's saying, well, let's find alternatives. Let's do other things. 
until about 2000. And then people take another look at nuclear again, saying they'd kind of not forgotten what happened in 86, but they said, okay, what are our options? We've got massive growth. We've got countries like India that 1.4 billion people, 400 million, no electricity. What are our options? I mean, we can't let people live without electricity. It's It's a source of life. So you start looking at nuclear again, Chinese are building, Indians are building. We were 2006, 2007, we didn't think there was enough uranium on the planet to feed all the nuclear <laughs> plants being built. Uh, price, just to give you a context, our, the price of uranium after Chernobyl and up to about 2003 was about $7 to $10 a pound. We sell it by the pound. When all of this building started, it went up to $136 a pound. Like the whole thing just went bananas. And so that carried on until what happened? March 11th, 2011. I remember exactly where I was, Fukushima. And you had, uh, you know, you had a, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake followed by a uh, 45 foot or 15 meter tsunami hit the shores of Northern Japan. It was devastation, 20,000 people died. None from the nuclear plant, by the way, none. But they couldn't uh, keep electricity, so the cores melted. And But if you'd have watched CNN through that, I did, you'd have said nuclear plant accident, 20,000 deaths, and people associated with that. And they said, oh, it was terrible. And it was. It was. I was there like uh, about three weeks after it happened. You wouldn't believe it. There's ships three miles inland, upside down. There are buildings just, it, just like a, a steamroller had gone through and massacred the place. But again... The perception was that the nuclear plant caused all of, all of that. Uh, and, and so we live with that. And so, you know, I say, you know, in the airline industry, we're not perfect. You know, the, guess what? Planes fall out of the sky from time to time, but we don't stop flying. But because people are comfortable with that, they just say, oh, an accident, we'll have to see what happened to the, those units and fix them up and we'll get better and it won't happen again. That's what we try to do. But the public isn't quite so forgiving on the nuclear side. When there's well, an no, because nuclear accidents, nuclear accidents are sound, feel big to people. They feel consequential. There's a sense of dread around what might happen. Yep, they, they do, and, and then they make movies about it. And uh, you know, most people get their their information. A lot of people from the China Syndrome or or, or the Simpsons yeah. or whatever uh, mode they have to to get. And 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 maybe that's a big fault of ours. That it's been a bit of a closed club, this nuclear club. We're all so smart. Uh, many came out of the nuclear Navy and a bunch of engineers, and we're not good communicators. Uh, uh, I heard Scott talking about uh, communications versus uh, advertising or whatever it was the other day, and I was thinking about that, and I thought, yeah, we're good advertisers. We're maybe not so good communicators. So a bit of our fault as well, <laughs> David. But, uh, you know, I, again, and then, you know, maybe it takes a while, and you, you look at Fukushima, that's 11 years ago. Well, a lot of kids weren't born 11 years ago or were, you know, and so they're coming up now and they're saying, what are the world's problems now? Climate change, climate crisis, climate catastrophe, global warming. We got to do something about it. What are our options? Well, there's this, this got uh, not perfect. This one, that's not perfect either. No. And so that's why I say we've got the toolbox and now we're getting another look again. And so that's, that kind of where it stands, David, today. Then there, then there's waste. Then there's the issue of waste. So this is something that everybody is, if you ask them, concerned about. They don't walk around concerned about nuclear waste, but if you were to ask them about nuclear, it would be one of the first things they would bring up. It's very widely understood that there's waste associated with nuclear plants that we don't particularly know what to do with. Um, how much... How much of a problem do you consider that to be? Like, let's say, for the sake of argument, that we're not able to, in the foreseeable future, find a repository that's acceptable to put the waste in. And we have to keep going the way we're going. Because I think that's a plausible political outcome. It's not a certain political outcome, but the states has been unable to cite their waste in Yucca Mountain for decades now. So let's just say that it's a while before we find a, 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 a place to put the waste. How concerned are you about that? Here's my take, David. And, and I've, you know, I've been in this business for 40 years 
And so I get that question all the time and I have to have an answer for it. And this may be overstating it, but I say I'm comfortable, very comfortable with what we do with our waste. If you want to see all the waste produced from all the Canadian nuclear reactors in 60 years, I'll take you and show it to you. I'll take you and show, uh, show it to you. We have it stored. We, I can tell you where every spoonful of waste is. Now, can the others, can others say that, uh, you know, we're pretty comfortable piping stuff up into the sky and kind of closing our eyes and say, oh, it's gone, it's out there. We can't do that. We have to manage our waste from cradle to grave. So we know we create waste when we're, uh, we call it used fuel, by the way, but uh, when, we're, uh, when we're generating electricity, we have to pay right off the bat. We're heavily regulated, as you know, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission that watches. We have to pay up front for that waste. We take that waste now when it comes out of the reactors, you have to cool it down five to 10 years. So we have pools to do that. And then we have containers that we put it in and we can store it on surface. We've been doing it for 60 years. Not a problem. Never a problem. Other countries are more advanced than us. Sweden has an underground repository. Finland has an underground repository. The French, same thing. U.S. back and forth on Yucca Mountain. We're working on it. We've got a, a fantastic agency, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, uh, led by a lady named Lori Swamy, super good person. They're, they've been working since Panama days in the 70s, you know, testing uh, what's the best technology. And, and, and the biggest ticket is probably getting social acceptance and getting people to say, uh, finding a host community and getting social acceptance that that's the best way to, to manage it. And I think we have an obligation as... You know, uh, at, at my age, uh, I benefited from the nuclear power, whether you liked it or not, you did. So to leave that stuff to our to our next generations uh, doesn't seem fair to me, and, and we should deal with it. But I'm comfortable, David, that, like you say, if you want to see the waste, I'll show it to you. I'm not sure everybody can say that. Um, I, will, I will say that I've done some research in this area, public opinion research in this area, and whether it is pipelines, or nuclear waste repositories, you cannot convince most people that humans know how to build a structure and put it into the ground that will never leak. People just don't believe that. So whether if it's a pipeline, they want to know what you're going to do when it leaks. If it's nuclear waste repository, they don't want to think about that at all. Yeah, and that's uh, that's part of the uh, the public acceptance, and you know it, it's a it's a dilemma. It's, we have to do something with it, but nobody likes the solution, <laughs> and so we can so we do what we're doing now is that we we manage it uh, temporarily, and I say temporarily, sixty years we've been doing it. We take it, we as I say, we cool it down, we put it into containers, we manage it in a facility managed by a a large agency that manages every ounce until we come up with the, the long-term solution, which I believe will be underground storage. And so that's what we're doing for now. I, I think it's the responsible thing to do. I think the irresponsible thing to do is to not deal with it. We have to deal with it and we can easy push it off just like climate change. You know what? 2030, 2040, 20, yeah, we'll be net zero by 2050. Oh, good. Uh, am I going to be here? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> But that's not good enough. There's got to be some accountability now. And that's coming around now on climate change. Is there's electron accountability. You can't just say, yep, oh, chemical is going to be net zero by 2050 and say, oh, good, we're out of that. Whew, got away from that one. That's good. Now they're saying, how are you going to do that? What are your goalposts? By when? And so th it's coming around. And so there's, there's more accountability now on our actions, David, and we're going to have to stand up, not just governments, but individuals and companies as well. Yeah, I just don't understand the risk calculation that people make that they think that the risk associated with nuclear waste is greater than the risk associated with climate change. Well, I think that's why we're getting some tailwinds uh, these days, why people are having another look and they're saying, okay, what was the problem again <laughs> with those guys and, and what's their issues? And is that, worse than, uh, is that worse than the temperature of the earth warming by three, four degrees uh, or should we take another look at that? And it's not the answer to everything. I never. But in the right countries that don't have other options, that don't have hydro, maybe don't have wind and solar or the land available, is that a good option? And I think Japan, you take Japan, we talked Fukushima. So Japan, 54 reactors before Fukushima, 
shut them all down after said, boy, this is, we're, that's bad. We're, we're out. And the government said, yeah, not so fast. We, we can't, what are we going to do? So they're buying gas at, you know, 20, $30 a MMBTU. Uh, it should be two. And they said, well, this is going to bust the economy. Then they're burning coal. Well, that's not helping with our Kyoto <laughs> obligations uh, at all. So now they're back to nuclear again. They said, well, you know, that they ran, they ran well. And so they've restarted 10 now, and we think they'll get up to about 25 or 30 units and they're buying uranium. David, your, your, your options are limited around the world. And, and some countries like Canada are absolutely blessed with a plethora of, of energy options. Others, not so much. Well, Germany shut down their nuclear plants in the wake of Fukushima as a reaction to Fukushima. And now that's one of the reasons why NATO is divided about uh, Russia and the Ukraine, because Germany is so heavily dependent upon gas from Russia. Yeah, yeah, that's another interesting story. You know, Angela Merkel, who was, uh, I, I think she was a nuclear scientist herself, which was a bit shocking, but it was a, a complete political reaction to the Fukushima accident. 17 units, they said, we want out of nuclear power. We're bringing in uh, energy vende, a new policy, a transition away from, from traditional sources, coal right. and nuclear. And we're going to wind, uh, wind and solar. And, and you can see how that's uh, turned out over there. Not, not as great as they had hoped. Of course, uh, the intermittency of the wind uh, and solar is a problem. They're back to burning lignite, which is uh, about the dirtiest uh, coal, like rubber boots, uh, burning to keep the lights on over there. And uh, and they're shutting down the nuclear plants. And so, and then they import nuclear power from France. Like, figure it out. Uh, it's politics. You're the expert in politics, not me. But that doesn't <laughs> seem like a rational. That doesn't seem to me like a rational approach to. Uh, to your energy supply and so and then of course you, you said it this week but it's I a country with a very strong it's a country with a very strong green party and the green movement is ideologically opposed to nuclear for reasons yeah. i don't really understand but they are yeah for for the most part uh, we are seeing uh, and i uh, you know some of the uh, environmental groups now just taking another look at nuclear and saying, okay, we've been opposed ab initio to nuclear power for all it, it, Greenpeace. It's in our credo. Uh, you know, Patrick Moore right. I guess, was the first to jump ship and, uh, and go over to the nuclear side. And I, I think he's been vilified by the, uh, by the, uh, by the green groups, but there, there are a lot of others uh, that are now saying like we, it, it's back to that. We cannot throw out a tool that might help us, solve climate change we can't throw one out just because we don't like it or it's got uh, it's got some issues with it they all have issues with them and so let's uh, let's be smart about it okay my last challenge to nuclear energy that i'm going to put is that it's not a renewable energy because it relies on what you do uranium and so and uranium is presumably a finite resource and let me pack something additional into this question which is, I didn't realize, in getting ready for this interview, I didn't realize that 45% of the world's uranium is in Kazakhstan. Um, that doesn't really sound like a very stable base for a global industry. Is there more uranium if we looked for it, or do we pretty much know where the uranium is now, and it's in Kazakhstan? Yeah, no, David, uh, th that that is not an issue that we're concerned about. Th we talk about uranium available at, at a price that makes nuclear uh, electric electricity uh, economic. I mean, when the, you see the reserves in Kazakhstan, and, and I've been there 25 times, uh, we have a small play there, actually. Uh, in Canada, there's uranium everywhere. It's, it's just at, at what price to, can you extract it from, from the ground? There's, there's uranium in your backyard or wherever you are <laughs> right now. It would be in such small uh, proportions that it wouldn't make sense to do it. So there, there's a lot of uranium out there. And, uh, you know, uranium or the nuclear fuel represents, I think, about 5% of the operating cost of a, of a nuclear plant. So whereas gas, you take a gas plant, it, it could be 75%. Uh, your capex isn't that much, but your, your fuel is expensive. Uh, ours is, the capex is enormous, but the fuel is cheap. So if you doubled the price of uranium, you, you wouldn't 
you know, your electricity rates wouldn't change uh, hardly at all. And so there is lots of uranium on the planet, lots to be uh, found yet, uh, even up here in northern Saskatchewan uh, by our big mines, lots more there. So I, I don't worry about that. And uh, you know what? Like I say, as we uh, we don't want it to be a transition uh, source of energy, but uh, let's keep working on the others. Let's work on geothermal. Let's work on wind and solar. And what a great combination in the meantime that we all, we're good at it, David. We're good at nuclear in Canada. I mean, we've been doing it since the, since the late 40s, 50s. Uh, we got a super strong regulator. We got utilities, Bruce Power, OPG, you got NB Power that are very good. We've got good professionals. We've got professional universities. We've got all the uranium you'd ever need. Let's not throw that tool out of the toolbox. Is this an economic opportunity for Canada? If there was a true nuclear renaissance in the world, is there more than just shipping uranium? Is this a technology and manufacturing opportunity for Canada? I mean, when I was a kid, and I don't know where I got this, whether it was school or what kind of osmosis, I was aware of can-do technology, and I was aware that I should be proud of can-do technology, that Canada made the best, safest nuclear reactors in the world. Now, my impression is over time, can-do has been overtaken globally by Westinghouse and, and other private um, manufacturers of nuclear plants. So what's the role for Canada in nuclear other than consuming? Yeah, well, there, there are a few things, uh, and we haven't talked about small modular reactors yet, or SMRs, and I'll, I'll get to that. But, you know, I I, uh, I, I won't soon forget, uh, first, uh, Jean Chrétien, back in his day, he was the best salesman for a uh, salesperson for <laughs> can-do reactors we ever had, selling them into China and around the world, and we were popular, and we did a good job. We had good support from the federal government at the time. We, uh, at that hurly burly that you had live in, in Ottawa in February of 2020, the Minister of Natural Resources, Seamus O'Regan, gave a speech to the crowd. I don't know if you heard it. It was like, for me, it was like Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech in, in 53. I mean, he was so positive on the role Canada could play around the world uh, with our can do technology, with our uranium, with our fuel manufacturing and with some of the SMR technologies, which are Canadian, and that Canada can be a leader with the stable geopolitical uh, situation government we have in Canada compared to others. I mean, Canada is seen around the world as smart and, and a leader. And so, yeah, I think we could export uh, our nuclear technology, not just the natural resources, but, but around the world and heavily regulated, which is super important that people know you just don't have a free ride uh, and the government's pushing you. I can tell you there's no free ride in Canada with uh, Rumina Velshi and the CNSC. We are heavily scrutinized. So yeah, I, I do believe we could, uh, as a team, we could uh, be out in the world and we're seeing it now. The US now uh, under President Biden, the tailwind now, I mean, what did he do? First day he signed Paris. And so he signed back on to the Paris agreement uh, unfortunately killed keystone xl uh, for us in western canada that didn't go over too well but then he held an earth summit he's been ratcheting down the uh, the time to get to net zero just about every conference he's at he's pledged you'll love this one he's pledged that by 2035 in the united states that all of the electricity created will be fossil fuel free like i just say wow wow what a transformation that'll right. take. I can tell you that won't happen without nuclear. And, and Seamus O'Regan left us with uh, the, the line that we've used now for two There's no path to net zero that doesn't include nuclear. And I've heard Mark Carney say it, and I've heard Bill Gates say it, and many others. And so it's getting some traction. You know who you haven't heard say it is Minister Gilbo. Um, and the Canadian government sends off conflicting signals about its attitude about nuclear, but it never sounds very enthusiastic, at least publicly. Um, Seamus O'Regan was the most enthusiastic about it, and he's no longer in that job. Um, so what is your perception of what the, where does nuclear fit into the Canadian government's plans? Well, that's a, that's a good question, David, and I'm not going to get deep into the, the politics on, on this, and I'll leave that for others uh, 
I know you were commenting on that a few weeks ago, uh, but you're right. Uh, the uh, the tone has softened enormously coming out of the federal government. Uh, although we we do uh, we do take some comfort in the prime minister's comments at COP26, where he said nuclear has to play a role going forward. And so we say, okay, I mean, if it was my shop and my uh, boss says uh, nuclear is going to play a role, then I can tell you nuclear is going to play a role because it'll funnel down through the organization. We wait to see how that's going to play out. But, you know, I say, and we have lots of conversations with the provincial government, who's pretty keen on uh, building SMR, small modular reactors here in Saskatchewan. We have to replace the coal. And so, you know, I say between, I say, you know, Premier, why don't you get together with the Prime Minister? We don't agree on much between Saskatchewan and Ottawa, but this is something we can work together on. We're all on the same page. We know we have to do something to combat climate change, to reduce CO2. We want to have nuclear. We've got uranium. The feds are involved. The Prime Minister supports us. Let's get together on this thing. This is a, this is an open book for us to get together and all work together and uh, that's uh, I, I've been championing, championing that uh, thesis for a while. I'm not sure how much traction I'm getting now, but Jonathan Wilkinson, I told you earlier, we worked together in, in Regina for a while. Uh, he, uh, he had a hand in saving the uranium industry back in 91, 92, when the NDP came in and said, ooh, maybe we should go to the three mines policy and then phase out uranium. And, and Romano, uh, with the help of Jonathan and others, said, no, that doesn't make sense. We're not doing that. And, and they pretty much saved it. So, like I say, the, the tradition is all over. The opportunity is fantastic. And if we work together, and it's not just us, it's Ontario. Ontario, David, count your light bulbs. Six out of 10 of them are fired by nuclear power. I mean, it's the best story in the world. You got rid of coal 15, 10 years ago. No smog days, right. no brownouts. I mean, we can do it, David. That's what gets me excited. We can do it, and, and we should do it as a country and do it together. Okay. And, and quickly, before we wrap up, small nuclear, small modular reactors are something to be uh, excited about or a little nervous about. It's a new technology. It's much quicker to employ, which will be a big benefit in climate change because we need to get moving. On the other hand, is it as rigorous? Is it as safe? as the big Darlington or Pickering plants or the Bruce plants? Yeah, so l let me just start by saying, like, we've been doing this for, for years. I, I mean, more in the, in the Navy. Submarine, we've got, we got nuclear icebreakers that use a small nuclear plant to run the icebreaker to crush ice through the Northwest Passage or wherever they go with those things. We've right. uh, run big ships with them, uh, submarines we've run with them. So we know how to do it at a, at a mini model scale. This is, uh, you know, most of the reactors that have been built, the 445 that are in existence, they big, 1,000 megawatts, 1,200 megawatts. You know, they can power big cities. This idea is, uh, is kind of a mini-me thing where you can uh, just reduce it in size. So uh, we call an, a small modular reactor somewhere between kind of 50 megawatts and 300. So something you could size to, like we think about it up north in Saskatchewan where we have uranium mines, where we pull maybe 70, 80 megawatts to run all, all of our mines. Well, right now we have coal-fired electricity that comes up from Estevan and we pipe it, uh, you know, 500 miles. Well, that doesn't even make sense. And so if you put one of those up there, you'd have a kind of a local area network and you put it in the ground and, and, and it runs. So, I mean, that's well, the concept. Too, right? Oil sands too, right? Yeah, oil sands too, and and they can use the heat off some of the models for their SAG D and and some of that. So so we are are we ahead of our skis? I hope not. Uh, right now, I think the regulator has twelve different models of SMR using different fuel, some using enrichment, some not. That uh, they're reviewing now. Uh, one of the leaders, so OPG is going to build the first SMR in Canada, Darlington. They have the site picked out. And they picked out the technology, GE Hitachi. So it's kind of a mini model of uh, what they've been running around the world for years. And they plan to have that up kind of by the end of the decade. And Saskatchewan's working with them. And, and I think Saskatchewan wants to build three or four of them in series after they work together on the, uh, on the first of a kind. And so, David, yeah, it's, it's coming. The U.S. is pouring huge government money into uh, the SMR. Joe Biden's just pouring money, the Infrastructure Act, the Build Back Better, if it ever passes, 
has huge money for nuclear because they know they're never going to get to their goals without including nuclear. Well, listen, that feels like a great note to end this conversation on. Um, is there still a place in Saskatchewan called Uranium City? Yeah, there is. Yep. It's, uh, it's uh, about as far north as you can get. It's a small community. It's one of our communities where we pick up employees to, uh, to take them to our mine sites from. I think there's maybe 200 people left in Uranium City. They run a fishing camp and a few other things. So there, there indeed is. Yeah. Yeah. When I lived there, I used to wait for the temperature from Uranium City to make me feel better about the temperature in Regina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's so great to connect with you i'm so happy you've done so well i obviously should have paid more attention in secure transactions and negotiable instruments <laughs> i too could be the ceo of a major company uh tim keep well and keep at it and uh, i agree with you uh climate change is the existential challenge of our time and we're not gonna we're not going to solve it without nuclear. So thanks for your work. Thanks for your efforts. And thanks for coming on the Hurley Burley this week. And David, thank you for what you do. Uh, you, you've really done a masterful job with the, the Hurley Burley and, and now the the curse. I mean, I, I'm one of those people that if it doesn't come on on time, I'm, I'm phoning somebody saying, where are those guys? Like, <laughs> what is going on? So keep it going, David. It's I love it. And uh, you're, uh, you're a great guy and you're doing a great service for Canada. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks to our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and to our sponsor, CN Rail, and to all you Hurley Burleyites out there. Thanks for listening. Take care. See you next week. Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley.